So yeah, uh, our guest this week is um, the wonderful um, Henning Craggard, um, who uh, recently did a wonderful concert at the RNCM, and we'd love to um, speak to him about um, all these amazing ideas that he brought up in, in this uh, concert. Um, he he uh, spoke to us um, about um, the, the role of improvisation um, and trying to uh, get the most meaning out of um, musical practice, um, and so also to do with um, the, the role of the, the arts in the, in, in the, the green shift. So, um, Henning, thanks so much for, for, for joining us, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. It's a pleasure to join you here on Zoom. If you see some colored balloons up here, it's just because my uh, my youngest son turned 11 years old, and we haven't taken those down yet after the birthday. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, so thanks so much for, for, for joining. Um, just to sort of get get some get the conversation going, um, I'd love to know. Um, I, I, I read uh, your your blog on how it was called and um, how meaningful do you want your life to be. Um, and maybe just to sort of start by by discussing some of those ideas. Um, in that blog, um, what do you see um, as um, most meaningful about about musical practice? How do, how do you get your practice to be so meaningful? Well, I will start with a quote by Gustav Mahler first, uh, which is one of my favorite quotes, and uh, it is something translated to English like. Uh, our duty on earth is to pass on the flame, not to store any ashes. And I think this is a very, very good quote, uh, because the flame to pass on, uh, I mean, whatever uh, humanity has got of good ideas, uh, composers, philosophers, whatever you make uh, love art, is uh, something you should be connected to in your daily practice. So I think many people think that practice is something a little bit tiring you need to do in order to later play really great and profound. But I think all practice can be meaningful. And that uh, if you never uh, lose touch of your inner feelings and your the whole sense of yourself, both intellectually and emotionally, even during practice for intonation or scales or something like that, then you can indeed uh, skyrocket your process. Uh, so uh, this way of thinking of practice has uh, got me to really enjoy practice in a much bigger level than I or much larger de degree than I did say when I was 20 years old. So I have started to do with my students in Oslo. I teach at the Academy of Music in Oslo. And it seems like the fastest way to transform the practicing and how you feel about the instrument is indeed through improvisation and a creative way of thinking. So rather than uh, having too much respect to the great composers and have a kind of attitude I was uh, taught when I was younger, like who am I compared with the great Beethoven or Bach? I think we should rather follow the advice from these composers themselves. So Bach himself told his students to extract the chord progressions of his pieces and start to improvise and compose their own pieces over his way of composing. and. If you do that, if you take, say, a piece you're working on by Bach, and you take out the chords, and then you start to be creative with the same chords, then when you return to the way Bach wrote it, you have a different you, way of doing it. So it's, it's a very liberating way to see, oh, this is the choice Bach made on these chords, and oh, that's very nice. And uh, the improvisation process, uh, which can very easily then lead to composing, uh, means also that uh, my students and also I, we read scores in a different ways, not as you have to do this, you have to do that, but more like a playground the opportunity. What can I do within this score? And that uh, then it is, of course, the musician's 
own voice which is heard. I'm just inspired by the score by Bach. So I don't think of I am the one who are supposed to do the will of Bach because who knows what he wanted, but I use the piece of Bach to express something I, at the moment today in 2024, think is of relevance to me. That doesn't mean I, of course, read letters from Bach's time and I'm very interested in historic practices and other things, but I don't do it to try to do the correct or the right way to do something because that way I think has almost destroyed the classical music uh, life by taking the responsibility away from the musicians and over that we are sort of just servants for some other great mind. And I don't believe in that approach at all. I think very, very many, myself included for many years, felt like I was strapped. I, I couldn't move. I had so many things I needed to do. I lost contact with my own spirit, my own will. And now uh, when I've transformed the way I'm thinking and also teaching, that opens more doors for uh, in any direction. And even if I then decide to go back to be very, very close to the score, it's not the same way as I did before. Hmm. Well, wonderful answer. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to anyone who's got any questions. Um, also on, on Zoom, if you want to uh, type any questions in the chat, that would be really lovely. Um, but does anyone have any questions um, uh, right now? Yeah, really? yeah I, I have a thought on my mind. So often I've come across um, some peers. I'm a pianist, by the way, not a violinist. Um, but I've come across some friends who sort of share your your thoughts, and they they are very free at the piano, and they often don't do what is in the score, you know, um, and or they take artistic liberties, and I completely respect their bravery and their courage. Um, but on the other hand, uh, in this day and age, I. Uh, we've been told a lot that we need to win some sort of competition in order to, you know, begin our careers. And especially when we are of this age and we are in a conservatoire setting, everyone is trying to compete. And I've seen these friends of mine suffer in these competitions that they, they don't get very far. They get kicked out just in the pre-screening stage because of the interpretive choices. So how do you balance this? Um, speaking to us as well, our age group as well. Um, well. Well, it is a very, very good question. First of all, the competitions can have a role, of course, and it can help some people, but it, it is never going to be fair. First of all, quite often in competitions, the pre-screenings are not done by the sort of very great famous artists. So quite often the pre-screenings are done by other people in competitions, which might have a completely different mindset than the final jury. That means that somebody who is selected away for those reasons for taking too much freedom might very well have won the competition if they had made it to the first round. <laughs> so. Uh, I just think that the path to trying to imagine what somebody else wants is also a way away from what you yourself believe in. So the more time you so, sort of try to make the wise decisions, what would be wise to do, the further away you get from what do I actually believe in myself. And in the very end, very many of the greatest artists we have today, if you see see them, very many of them has a very distinct personal voice and play with wonderful freedom. Quite many of them probably would also have been screened away by the pre-select jury. Uh, but uh, my advice, maybe it's a blessing in, the, in disguise if you are not selected to something also. so. Uh, some of my students also think, oh, I'm going to audition for this and this orchestra for that and that position. Some of them dare to be themselves and are accept accepted to the orchestra because they did that. Some are turned away also because they dared too much. And some people in the orchestra said, oh, uh, they took too much liberties. But in that case, maybe it's a blessing in disguise. Can be that with 
the person who wants this level of freedom be happy in an orchestra who doesn't want it? That's not for sure either. So I just think that uh, calculating to not do what you love most uh, is a more dangerous path in the long run. <laughs> so, uh, and I think, um, anyway, I've been in many juries and competitions and uh, it's very, very hard to pre predict what will happen. So uh, one strategy might be exactly working the opposite way. Maybe one jury are absolutely looking for people who dare to be themselves and take much liber liberties. And imagine then if you really know what you want, but you listen to your conservative teacher and you hold it back to please the jury more. And then you get the comments afterwards that, oh, but you were too conservative, you didn't dare enough. That would be more irritating to hold back your true voice, I think, than to be thrown out because you dared to show it. So in the long run, I would go for do what you believe in and make your practicing be about that. But I must mention one thing. I was once a soloist in a symphonic orchestra with Mozart fifth violin concerto. And I got the following compliment uh, from uh, one of the orchestra members. And he said to me, oh, this is the best Mozart I ever heard. And I said, yes, thank you. Uh, and he said, but you know, if you had auditioned for a 2 second violin, you would have gone straight out in the first round. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was very interesting. So I think if there are anybody who, in, who is in the jury of symphonic orchestras, my advice would be don't pay too much attention to if they play one note out of tune or do a little rubato or forget the subito part or piano. Look for the potential who can bring your orchestra to the next level. And I know that because I've heard what, for instance, Berlin Philharmonic are looking for, and they are throwing out people who have been on trial because they don't dare to show enough personality. So it can be the other way also. So I think the very best orchestras might look for potential and the sort of third best orchestra would look who blends best into the group already. But if you blend into orchestra, you're not going to change it to the better. You need to dare to show something to, to get it moving. So I think many orchestras can be better if they adopt a strategy of letting in people who has a great passion and dare to show it because a good conductor could then use all of that energy and get an even better result. Mm -hmm. um, just on that point about um, Mozart, um, I was just in a class with um, Lynn Fletcher who, who sends her love um, and she's, she, I, was, I was asking her for, for reference recordings um, for, for, for Mozart concertos and she was a bit puzzled at first um, you know, like she, she didn't quite know who to say, and I mentioned your name, and she, she was like, him, him. <laughs> so, um, it's, a, it's a credit to your playfulness, I think, in um, in, in Mozart. And um, how how on on that point, how do you get to that point where you? Because Mozart is is so full of like absolute fine details in in all this, um, you know, articulation in the classical way. So how how do you balance this um, absolute sort of upper limit to to, to freedom? with this sort of closing down to the discipline of getting the notes just right? Well, the way I think about inspiration and freedom is really to feed the, your subconscious with a lot of information from very many aspects and then allow the moment to have uh, much liberties. So I will be quite concrete with that. That means in reality, I study the score first to find things I love about the harmony and things I love about the rhythm. And then I will uh, look at the shape of the, like the dramaturgic shape of a piece, like think of it as a movie or a, a film, that what is the storyline, the narrative, what do I need now? Do I need sort of uh, after a long period of uh, build up, do I need like a climax there or do I need like a, quiet place. So, uh, uh, and this, uh, the reason I started to practice that way is that I found that there isn't even when playing, there isn't one aspect of the music, which is important. It's the total, but the brain has a, a limited capacity, especially the analytic part of the brain 
So by doing one and one of these, finding first all the things I love of harmony, then all the things I love about you know scoring, then all the things I love about the uh, sound of the violin part, and doing it multiple times, then I'm feeding uh, the bigger part of my brain, the one I don't have direct access to, with so much in information that when I am on stage and try to just have a good time playing, what we call inspiration is that part of the brain popping up with some uh, suggestions, which I then do, which feels like complete, complete freedom. But it is actually uh, uh, pre-programmed uh, by, by me looking for meaningful things at multiple levels. And uh, I think then um, this way of practicing, I got inspired because I read the article about, did you know, any of you play uh, any of you speak two different languages? Yes, great, me too also. And do you know if you read the same book in both of these languages, you will know that better than if you read it twice in the same language. It's the exact same book, it's different parts of the brain for your different languages. And it doesn't stop there, so it means that if you learn a piece from really multiple angles, and you, you really look at the uh, uh, freedom of tempo, dynamic, vibrato, pedaling, if you are a pianist, you can look, but uh, the way I do it, I look for things which makes me love the piece. And I would even then do, for instance, playing a Mozart concerto in half the tempo, but as if it was a concert. And if I find then things of great beauty, something which I don't really notice when I play fast, then that will change how I play it faster as well. So you find something you love, the more things you love at the more, more different angles, the better story you have to tell potentially. And then, uh, if you then uh, like a bursting, I, I love things about the melody, I love things about the harmony, and you have way too much to tell, then it's about respecting the moment of time. So I go on stage without a, a concrete plan. It's not fully planned, but I have so many things I love. I can start and then my subconscious will switch. So I will not think about articulation. I will not think about harmony, but I will look for how in that moment, in that acoustic, I can tell the story in a way which pleases me. Mm, uh, yeah. uh, I, I do want to follow up with what you said uh, with, the me with the memory of listening to your masterclass in the RNCM a couple of years back. I remember when uh, there was a student playing the Tchaikovsky concerto and when you say learn a piece from multiple angles, I, I was and still am impressed by how well you knew the piece you played whole sections of the accompaniment on the violin and you were able to give feedback to the accompanist for the student in a way about which made the performance come through. It was astonishing and that tells us to the, that I was, uh, I, I learned how, how much work goes behind being free in the moment and how much information one has to have before they can express their freedom and just play because it's not just complete arbitrariness, it's, it's like really disciplined uh, learning as well. And uh, uh, in following up with that, I come from a different perspective than uh, than the previous question about competitions. I am on the other end of the spectrum in a, of a conservatory student in that I began learning the violin when I was 19 years old and I'm an adult student uh, through and through. So, I, so to, uh, in my mind, I feel like I need to be focusing on more fundamentals and techniques and more open strings and more scales than actual repertoire. And so I, my question is how much does um, your earlier section of meaningfulness and freedom have plays a role in in learning just technique and fundamentals. Is it something you have to consider once you once I have done? Or I should consider once I've done the bulk of the work on etudes and fundamentals, and then I think about freedom. Is it freedom after order, or is it I should start thinking about it now so that at the end I can still have it? So I quite don't know how to approach it, and so that's. What, uh, it is a very good question, and I think everything which is important needs to be with 
from the start. So I think it would be a waste of time to think that you need to learn the fundamentals without the meaningfulness or without the freedom, but think rather than, let's say that you need to do really fundamentals. What is the fastest way to learn this in a most inspiring way? So let's say you want to have better control of your bowl technique, for instance. How can you learn that in an inspiring way? And then uh, the way I use uh, to better when I need to better my technique is to use it to to uh, through a way of improvisation, but where I limit uh, certain things to make um, I can I can improvise within a certain scope then. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you want to practice long bows, but it's very, very um, uninspiring to do the open, open D string for five minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then let's say you want rather to do a slow improvisation. And then you can, the only thing you decide is that you will move the bow rather slowly. And so let's say you want that. You can start with one note. So you can just play. And my method would be then not force yourself to do anything. You just change the note when you feel like you change the note. But then you will make music, you will try to make maybe a certain mood or a certain melody or something like that. And you do it in the scope of moving slowly, but it would then pass through your uh, musicality or your sense of appreciation to music. And in my view, uh, that would also lead to a much better bow technique in a much faster time than if you were to do the sort of etudes but without a heart so that means that even if you were to practice say scales i think it's the way i think about things like scales is that if you do it without your musicality involved it can still be useful but it is also may sort of uh, you get used to playing without your musicality so it's like a medicine. So on the backside of all the medicine, it says, uh, do not take more than this and this dosage a day. Uh, and otherwise it could start to harm you. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's say that you want to do scales and etudes of a certain sort, but then you should ask yourself, am I still as much in love with playing the violin? Do I love music as much? Uh, if not, uh, you will start to get the side effects uh, of that. <laughs> and then instead of consulting a physician, I would say consult a piece of music you love uh, instead of rinse with cold water is rinse mm -hmm. with uh, improvisation or uh, a melody mm -hmm. from your heart. So, so, but even better is then to, to combine. If you decide to, the, to combine all the technical practicing you need to do with your musicality, then instead of now I will play how I've heard very many do it, uh, but I haven't done it in a long time, sort of scales not from the heart. It's meaningless. It's painful to my musicality. Uh, but you can still do the same scale, but and let it pass your true musicality, and then it is acts like a melody. This is a, in fact how I practice with my children at home. I let them play a scale, and I do an accompaniment so it feels like they are playing a melody <laughs> while they play the scales. But you can you do that yourself. So I do believe if you look back in history, when does the really instrumentalist uh, revolutions happen and why did they happen? And you can see that most of the persons who got extremely good in a short time, like Chopin on the piano, he would improvise and compose. Same with Paganini, he would improvise and compose. Same with Liszt, improvise and compose. And they got 
immensely much better in a very very short time so i do think the creative way is also much faster mm. because when you, when you try to express something then you learn much better way what i do not like at all is that uh, the way of after a master class somebody is playing and let's say they are not expressing anything of value and then they are told oh watch your elbow is a bit too high your wrist is a bit uh, too loose and then they get a lot of other things what is the chances they will express more from their heart after hearing that now they get gets more lost in the wilderness <laughs> so <laughs> i do believe as musicians are assuming that you want to uh, play in such a way that you tell something the audience will appreciate the best way to do it is that you appreciate it yourself you you do something you find is meaningful don't get used to having an instrument here doing things which are not meaningful so that would mean like if you were an author and wrote uh wanted to write a novel do you think well first you must be be better in spelling then you must be better in grammar no <laughs> Shakespeare used different spelling for the same word in, even in the same play and they, they didn't have really a, a grammar at that point uh, to the degree we have now. Just write. So my mother who is a, a teacher of languages who teach Norwegian and French, did teach French in school, she quarreled with some of her colleagues about the same because when people are doing an essay like in your own language on a subject, what you need then is to be uh, valued for all the things you express, not to see like red lines every time you have done a misspelling of something or forgot to write uh, the correct way uh, currently in fashion of uh, grammar and things like that. And so I think uh, we must really look in a different way on music. Uh, so I do believe that you love music, otherwise you wouldn't start. <laughs> so the more you can build on that love and make your technique better through what you genuinely love, the faster the process would be. But then of course, I would recommend you then if you are practicing a piece to learn it from many angles. So you can go through it with your musicality to, to find things you like with the sound, to enjoy uh, certain things when how nice the violin sounds when it is in tune. <laughs> so you can then reduce tempo, you can one by one. And afterwards, you can also record yourself and listen to it and find that actually I thought I was doing it very organic, but my rhythm, I was actually rushing here, in, not in the way I thought I did, but much more. So you can learn something by feedback. But, uh, but the goal should be to, I think, to tell something you think is of value. So let's say you are um, in your normal life, you experience something incredible, like you have never experienced in your life. And then you meet a friend at a cafe later that day, you will tell about that. You will not think about how you tell it, you will tell it and it will be exciting. Uh, if you didn't experience anything particularly interesting, of course, you could go to the cafe and have a nice time, but that would be sort of less of a thrill for you to tell because you didn't have such a good story. So I would suggest if you want to learn a piece, this, what I do is I don't start with the, the violin. So when I want to play a violin concerto or a sonata, I take the piano reduction or the piano part and I start to play very very slowly through on piano because I'm a, I'm a really bad pianist and that makes me play so slow that I can really appreciate the chord changes so I find things that way then I start to think on these chords how the melody could sound because I found out also that uh, you can really never think you can never play better than you can think something but quite often you can think it better than you can play it so if you are able to hear like a chord in your uh, or a chord progression in your head or play it on piano and you can think the violin part if you can think it much better than you can play then you know exactly how you want to play and then you can sort of remove whatever is preventing you to getting there 
but if you just want to be better and you know practice fundamentals but without that heart it is a longer way and it's easier to get lost so uh, I think uh, there is plenty of examples of people who started really late and got really good in a short time and all of them did it with passion and heart I think mm. I've never heard about somebody who started from a sort of technical point of view and then got a good musician so uh, do not waste your time build on what you already love and expand what you love uh, yeah. and don't think even of easy or like rhythm and intonation and bowl technique don't think about that as uh, separated from your musicality because it's not thank you so much that's such a wonderful answer and you're right the, the feeling of getting lost is something i'm very familiar with <laughs> in my practice uh, i will be working a lot differently now with this input thank you. and but also getting lost has a value so every situation we are in in life has a learning point so what, when you are in a really 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 bad situation what is the learning points there so when you you feel lost that's a way to find what kind of values or what kind of thoughts brings you back to not feeling lost and the shorter time it takes so if you during your practicing feel lost and then you stay lost for two hours then you are lost in two hours if you feel lost and then find things you love and you 30 seconds later do not feel lost your progress is going to be much much quicker so it's not, not about how many times we fall but how many times we keep lying before we rise up and start walking so then of course motivation is also so important and i think it's also very very interesting that most people who who go to some place like royal northern college of music are really really good at what they do and i'm always fascinated when i uh, watch say britain got talent or some uh, something like that and you see somebody who picked up uh, ukulele or something and learned three chords and that was enough and then they sing from the heart and they move everyone mm -hmm. i think we are all overqualified in classical music life often but using like one percent of our potential <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, but the trick then is to pick a piece which is within your scope somewhat so you can express your feelings so i would not uh, for you or for anybody don't only play difficult pieces plays play also really easy pieces mm -hmm. which is, sort of feels easy so you can storytell from your heart without resistance and if you then want to pick the really really most difficult pieces that would be the equivalent to go to mount everest uh, I think to go to Mount Everest just to tell people, oh, I was at the top of the Mount Everest is not a good reason. So the same, it's not a good reason. Oh, I've played all the full 24 Paganini Caprices. No, why? So for me, the reason to go to the top of Mount Everest would be to enjoy the view. Yeah. So, so if I want to learn it, that difficult piece, which feels like Mount Everest, it's not to be able to brag about it, but it would be because I love something about this uh, Mm. Uh, so pick pieces you do love or you think you're going to love don't pick pieces which are just Mount Everest or something like that because art is not about that I also used an equivalent like that with let's say that you like a certain actor really really well um, which actors do you enjoy in the movie uh, industry. Uh, recently, uh, I enjoyed uh, Careless of the Flower Moon, so Robert De Niro and Leonardo DiCaprio enjoyed that movie really well. Yeah, exactly. So Robert De Niro, a fantastic actor. Would you think that he is a less good actor than, uh, say, Tom Cruise? Because Tom Cruise does all the stunts in his movies himself. No, not at all. <laughs> it is how I feel sometimes about virtuosity, that we pay too much attention to virtuosity in yeah. classical music. 
So some of my favorite actors, like Anthony Hopkins, of course, he's not able to do these crazy jumps. No, <laughs> <laughs> the, the real art is his personality, mm -hmm. which he's able to express. So my definition of technique is not has nothing to do about virtuosity, but it's very easy. So when I want to define what is technique, technique is the ability to express what you feel. So if you do not really know what you feel about the piece, you are not in love with it, true technique is actually not possible. Then you are just expressing something else. This is like false technique. Okay, you can play fast, you can play in tune, but there isn't a story there. So what's the point of it? In my view, not no point at all. So the true technique, which means that it's easier in a competition to judge people if they play a slow movement by Mozart than by Tchaikovsky's violin concerto. <laughs> because uh, you have no technique, no virtuosity to hide behind in the Mozart. And then you think, are they actually playing a song from their soul, which sort of are so strong that they, uh, they reach the audience. And this is what I think you mentioned Robert De Niro. Yeah. He's able to do that. He's present in the moment and you feel, okay, he has some genuine. So don't be too concerned about the car chases and the, uh, <laughs> all the stunts and all the wild things. It can be entertaining, but in my view, I think it's very strange, even if you compare pop music and classical music, it seems that we have this obsession for virtuosity in classical music. Everything is so difficult. Uh, Mozart has a role to his father and he was very worried about this. And he said, says, music is way too much about virtuosity. It should be. That's not the true soul of the music. What has happened after Mozart <laughs> has the world become less technical and less virtuosic, not at all. So I think there is a case for, uh, I mean, I love Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto, but I really think it's written a little bit more difficult than it needed to be written. <laughs> and many of my favorite places it, it is in it, it's absolutely not the most technical challenging, like the octaves at the end, bum, 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 bum. It's like being to a, um, like uh, Tivoli or I don't know the English word fairground or something like that. So uh, my least favorite place is Tchaikovsky. I had to practice way too much. There's a wonderful question in the chat from Luca. I'll, I'll just read it out for those who are just listening. Um, he, he says, I was reading the book Creativity by um, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, the, the psychologist who recognized the concept of the flow state. Uh, he argues that something can be considered creative only if it has social recognition and if it's uh, accepted by the relevant field. So do you believe that creativity is based on our inner assurance that what we create is new and valuable or based on the fact that we create something genuinely new that is valued enough to be recognized by other people and just on top of that question i'd like to add the the, the further question of is is this problem that you're addressing um you, you addressed it on a personal level like you, you you used to be um quite sort of obsessive over the details but do you think it's also more of a structural issue within the classical music world um, about trying to find this um, way of understanding creativity is, is something that's really meaningful this was a very advanced and long question with the, I'm trying to remember all you said now, <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, I haven't read that book myself, uh, but regarding creativity, I think you cannot really define it. So, uh, it does not need to be, uh, uh, recognizable by like a major part of the uh, population, of course. Quite often, somebody has started with something which wasn't uh, recognized immediately and took some time. So I think uh, to to I wouldn't uh, try to define creativity too narrowly. So I think creativity could be best to define just is of what excites yourself and what makes you want to create something which hasn't been in the world before. And then uh, your passion when you make it 
can in the beginning maybe be ununderstandable for people. That is the case with many composers who then later in life manage to distill those ideas down to something even simpler, which really hits people. So uh, I wouldn't be too afraid if your creativity in the beginning was a little untamed and maybe uh, messy, <laughs> uh, but then look for what is the essence of that creativity? What can you distill it down to something simpler or something more sort of immediate? And this is what I think my favorite of the great composers have done. You can look at Dvorak, for instance. His later works is in a way simpler than the earlier works, and it's easier to listen to, even though the earlier works contain much of the same. It's just uh, harder to follow him uh, because he, he tries to be clever in <coughs> more intellectual ways earlier, and he trusts the music, his musicality in a simpler way, or he has found a simpler way of expressing the sort of same thing later in life. So, and this can be later in the process also. So quite often when I compose myself, I start with a very, very easy idea. Sometimes something I found out when I was improvising. And then as I try to build a piece, part of my brain wants to be clever and want to better that idea. But I do record all and uh, I save all the older ideas. So when I have made it better and better and better, I then listen back to the original idea and then I find what of my what of the things which I thought was better is actually ruining the ruining the original idea? What was just a trick by my brain, or oh, I wanted to be a counterpoint, or I invented the melody, or make a fugue out of it? What should I remove because it's not the essence of this music? And uh, so, because I think, in a way, uh, that thing get more and more advanced it seems to always have to reset, which is very interesting. So the Baroque music culminated with Bach writing fugues, which no, maybe no other person on earth could have made, but it couldn't continue like that. Then you get the Rococo and the classic area where people explore the melody much more, but on a much simpler, uh, uh, like chords, it doesn't move as often and other things. So, uh, um, I think then towards the end of the Romantic era, when they try to make the uh, harmonies more and more advanced and it got more and more chromatic and then it, you couldn't go any further, then in my view, the, the mistake Schoenberg did was to proclaim that tonality was dead just because he had, you know, made it more and more advanced in a certain way. Later in life, he actually said that he had been wrong, but the follow his followers didn't really promote uh, that he started post <laughs> tonal music at then. So I'm, I still think in the 12th note uh, music, there has been written fantastic works like the Alban Berger Violin Concerto and other pieces. But I think the mistake is we think advanced is better. It's not. So uh, it's clear that after Schoenberg uh, then becomes so advanced, then, of course, Shostakovich still used to tonality, but in a much simpler way, and it clearly wasn't dead. Uh, mm. And the same with a lot of other composers. So uh, the, the tragedy may be in modern painting and in modern music, and uh, basically everything you can say contemporary in uh, has this problem is that part of it uh, has then not been reset. So. Uh, it's starting to change now, maybe the last 20 years, that painters can paint uh, any way they like anymore. But there was a certain area in the maybe 1960s and 70s where respectable composers couldn't really uh, compose the way they wanted and painters couldn't really paint figuratively. But luckily, the world is in a better place now. But the thing I'm looking for then, I don't think, uh, think making things advanced makes it better. So be careful when you practice or compose that when the analytic part of your brain gets really exciting about, you know, making it more and more complex, maybe it's not the best idea to do it. Mm. So I, when I listen to one of the Schub Schubert's best songs, the piano accompaniment is so simple. It doesn't take away the uh, focus from the text and the melody. And 
if you then rewrote that Schubert song more like uh, a later romantic composer would have done it and elaborated the piano part, you probably would make it less good. <laughs> Mm, it's very interesting. I, I, was, I was recently playing um, Brahms' uh, first time game where he, he rewrote it when he was older, in maybe yes. his 50s or uh, you know late 50s, and he wrote it initially when he was sort of like maybe our age, kind of yes. uh, very, very young. Um, and so you see a lot of this, um, you know, overindulgence in, in the music is sort of stripped back um, by the, the older Brahms. Um, so something that's more simple but is much more direct and sort of hits you, goes straight to the heart. Um, so I, I was wondering just on, on this point, it's really interesting, it sort of mirrors some other conversations that we've also had at the Philosophy Society about a thinker called um, Ian McGilchrist, um, who um, has a book that's all about the two different uh, halves of the brain and how um, they've evolved to sort of see things two different ways. So for example, um, he, he says that the, the left hemisphere of the brain is very focused on sort of local, um, like uh, focused uh, things, whereas the right hemisphere is very much global. Um, like he uses the example of like a, a bird, for example, who uses the, the left hemisphere to um, specify some food on the floor, like to, um, you know, uh, sort of picking it out from the surroundings, but is with the other half is, 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 is looking out for predators. Um, and, and that's sort of an evolutionary way of looking at it. But with this idea, in, in, in music, um, so to bring it back to Brahms, he said that um, inspiration without sort of craftsmanship is like a, a, a reed in the wind. It's like it's, it needs that other half to help it um, to sort of be married together. Um, I was wondering, it's a bit of a long question, but you, you addressed this um, issue of, you know, just being focused in on, on, on one thing about classical music. Um, on, on a very personal level, you said you used to be like a perfectionist and that was sort of getting in the way. Um, do, you, do you think it's more of a broader issue in, in the classical music world? How, how do we get back to this um, or, or get towards this uh, idea of um, having these two halves um, of, of understanding it? Yes, well, I will try to answer that. I think I like to simplify things as much as possible. Uh, so I think uh, to mainly today's problem in classical music life is that we have become way too much uh, concerned about the surface of things. How well is it together? How well is it in tune? How well does it follow the hen, the Urtex edition or whatever we think like that? And the sort of inner deeper meaning of the music or what you can read between the lines or something like that, we are spending too little time on. So I will try to uh, explain in this way that when a piece is, uh, when I feel I really know a piece, when I have gone through it from multiple angles, harmony and details and everything from aspects and I feel I know this piece now, it's part of me, then I think about it as a river. So this river is floating there, but it can float there in morning time in night time, in spring and in summer. And what happens at, at the surface, the ripples, the actual surface? I do not want to control that. I think that's the road to misery, that if we are more concerned about the surface mm. than the actual river of things, this makes the, the problem. So I even refuse to think about, even if it's what you say is true, that there is two parts of the brain, uh, I think my goal is much simpler. I want to be present in my own life while I live it, while I play, while I practice. And I will not even separate my creativity from my intellect. I want both to be present. And uh, I think then like some of the great composers, and you mentioned Brahms and I can mention Bach and others, has proven that you can be fully intellectual and fully emotional at the same time. So if you listen to Brahms' fourth symphony, it is a fantastic piece of music where you feel uh, the brain and the soul sort of go hand in hand. But uh, I think his, his explanations about things, like intellectually when he talk about it, I don't agree about all of that. I will tell you some story that when Gustav Mahler had composed one of his very first uh, works, the Piano Quartet, 
Mm. In Gipander, he brought it to Brahms, which was his big he hero. But Brahms didn't like it, and he sort of trashed it, and Mahler was really very disappointed. <laughs> and Brahms had told him, you should look more into the four, four, four bar structures. And, you know, he saw it from his perspective. But again, uh, I think uh, Brahms, of course, created a fantastic world. Bach has done the same, but Mahler has made a very different approach where it is absolutely less structure. <laughs> and much more freedom and uh, then of course you need the particularly good conductor and orchestra to be able to do that without making a mess out of it uh, so it's understandable but uh, i do think that uh, from the last question also when you spoke about the, the state of flow in the, the creativity uh, the, the flow is when you can do something and it's sort of automated and you you know you go along but i think there is a higher state than flow so the higher than flow is then that when you after you have done it you have been emotionally traveling it can can be on top of the flow state but it is not something uh, which your subconscious do alone you are still able to use your analytic part of the brain at the same time and you, you will have the sense of being a whole person, you think holistically that all of you are present. And I uh, I know when that feels, then it gives a moment, a value to the moment. While many many of you have read maybe the inner game of tennis, have you read I've that? Inner game of music. And, um, but, uh... Yeah, but, but this is, I, I recommend everybody to read The Inner Game of Tennis because that's written by him. The Inner Game of Music is written by a musician. So The Inner Game of Tennis is a fantastic book. Uh, but, but that describes this state of flow in a great way. But later in his life, when he wrote The Inner Game of Work, uh, it is, has even then an even more profound level. And this is where I got the picture of a river floating, even if he does, does use it in a different way. And um, uh, I don't, I am skeptic to anything who takes out one part of the human being. So I think, for instance, Bach at, at his best can be uh, playful and intellectual at the same time, using the whole brain. Uh, and, uh, but you can see composers who struggle with form, like it's, everything is very loose. They have much to gain by engaging uh, probably a different part of the brain also, because they are using not the whole of themselves. While composers like maybe Brahms and especially Bach sometimes can even, for my taste, get too intellectual. Like I don't love all of the fugues as well. And I think actually some of Bach's uh, best works are the, the sort of works where he tried to copy the style of Vivaldi or something, second violin, uh, the double concerto for two violins, second movement, which is sort of simple to be Bach. Uh, but uh, I'm looking for when do I feel like a whole human being? It's not only my emotions, which I get tired of without structure. It's not only the structure, which can feel meaning meaningless, like a building nobody lives in. But when do I use all of me? And then I think it's up to the persons. So I think when we were speaking about Schubert, it's uh, he had such bad self-esteem. He wrote to his brother that, who am I compared to Beethoven? I can nothing. And three months before he died, he enlisted to the local organ player to learn counterpoint. He felt he wasn't good enough in counterpoint. But he was clearly tastefully able to write some of the best music ever written within the scope of what he did know. So even if he felt oh, like inferior to Bach and Beethoven, he, his musicality, instead of then trying to write uh, very complicated f fugues and other things, he composed music he was able to compose. And then his sense of timelessness and the, you know, the big scope he brought something completely new to the music, uh, which wasn't, uh, of course, with counterpoint, not nearly as advanced as Beethoven and Bach has, has been, but it had had some benefits. It, it freed the sense of uh, 
landscape and the timeline. So uh, he dared to, for 10 minutes, let almost nothing happen, and it was wonderful. Mm, lovely. Yeah. So did you have a question? Yes. Uh, following up on this, there is something that I feel is, um, you've not said it exactly this way, but I feel like I can infer from what you've said that assessment or the process of assessing things is doesn't really go hand in hand with creativity in a certain sense because Brahms might have said poorly of Mahler and he would have said poorly of other people but do you think some of the people he spoke poorly about weren't that creative and that's why he spoke poorly about them and so while he while his process of sense making apparatus is capable of is not infallible there is still at some point of time, an assessment or filter procedure where we can say, okay, so these are good composers and these are these are good performers and these are. Is there something like that in the view that you are uh, espousing here? I will see if I can understand. Of course, I'm sure there was a lot of bad composers who showed bad pieces to uh, Brahms. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, but, but, but I, uh, what I meant was merely that the the particular genius of uh, Mahler, which was already in bloom, maybe not in full bloom, was a focus field for Brahms. So he didn't recognize what was genius about it then, I think, which is very natural. So he lived within his own scope. Mm. Uh, but uh, what you wanted to know, you said... As, uh, in, 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 in other words, when my teacher is, says that he doesn't like the way I'm performing, I would like to believe that that's because there are several things I can improve upon, not that my my paradigm is different to my teacher and I'm Mahler and he's Brown. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so no. where, where do I start doubting myself and when do I stop doubting and just express? Like, where is the line there? Yeah. Well, even better, I mean, I constantly do the same mistake myself, but even better than your teacher telling you what he doesn't like would be your teacher to tell him what he would love even more. And if you then agree with her or him that you also love that idea even more, then you would do it because you love it even more. And the, uh, it will replace something of a certain meaningful with something even more meaningful. And that would be the best path. And if you then were able to express what you meant somewhat with your language, then also maybe your teacher can say, oh, is this what? Or you could maybe sing it for your teacher. This is how I want it. Mm -hmm. And then your teacher says, okay, but you know, that's not what I hear when you play. And then we can start removing the obstacles to what you want. But it's not very interesting for you to know what your teacher wants. Uh, I think, because that make, can make you confused. The interesting thing for you would be to want something even better, because th that would give you the straightest path to achieving that. So uh, next time a teacher says to you, I don't like that, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do then try to see, ask back, so what, how do you, what, what do you love most about this and get it by, taught behind it. But then, I think it's also a possibility because we are raised in a very non-liberal way of playing. We are very, very true to the uh, written score. So quite many times, you know this saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> <laughs> so people would say something to you, don't rush. And I say, why not? <laughs> rushing, can be, rushing can be exciting. So I would say, don't rush more than you yourself like but i mean when you get excited your heart starts beating faster and we know at the time in the romantic era everybody was much freer with tempos so i think this is a liberty which is generally been taken away from us so that we do an unconvincing way of rushing when we are stressed not for musical reasons of course then you don't really want it if you're hairy but if you can do a build up and then a teacher says yeah but it's not printed in the score so if you love it more should you fail the score or fail your own feelings anyway while reading about it you will find that these composers did actually very often in their letters express uh, that they enjoyed a lot of freedom so brahms even if he's known today for being very formal his playing wasn't so he were all over the place with the tempos for instance and took liberties so quite often it's also a 
falsifying of history that we think we know what notation means. But I have a class where I teach, uh, or did have a class, and I use it now in my teaching about uh, notation. What does notation actually mean? And uh, the normal way for notation when it become used to become uh, normal to be specify more of the things in the romantic era was not to uh, prevent people from playing what they wanted but it was to inspire them you can think of it as one possible interpretation so wh when mendelssohn wrote his violin concerto there is letters between mendelssohn and ferdinand david discussing what should be written in the score. And then they refer to that they had published the Beethoven Violin Concerto, which was already then unknown. And they were disappointed with the violinists of the time who just played what was in the music and didn't put enough of the heart. And then a great discussion was, we should not do the same mistake when publishing my Violin Concerto, Mendelssohn writes. So we need to put in a lot of crescendos, lots of sorchatos, lots of things in the score not because it's the only way to play it but just to get people invested enough to really love it so they sort of expected people to anyway do what they want but to just raise the game and so today i think we misunderstand this so we think that this is the one and only way to play it he has written a crescendo he has written a, a, a piano and this is the way it has to be done but notation didn't grow out of this way it is the opposite we must tempt the musicians to really oh here is a lot of things to do and it was expected then that they anyway did whatever they wanted so there is a letter when brahms heard a um, russian pianist play one of his pieces and brahms had written pianissimo and this russian pianist played fortissimo instead and he brahms writes to i think clara schumann and said it was wonderful how he filled the hole with big sound where I've written pianism. He liked it. Uh, so he just saw, uh, this is a different way. So think about the notation as one of the many interpretations of the composers documented for you. So you can see this is a one way to play that piece, but it's not the way. And that gives a lot of freedom. Now there is a lot of other composers who, who do specify everything. And to them, I will give the advice, do not take the liberty away from the musician. So I, in my composition, I write some extra. I write that all the things I've written in is to make me like the music better. And if somebody <laughs> finds a way to play it, which they like even more, they are allowed to change it to something they like even more. Uh, and I, I, I'm depressed that I have to include a thing like that because people are too lit literal about it these days. Uh, but uh, anyway, even if you play by a composer who says, I want it exactly this way, of course, your duty being on stage is to tell something you think is of value for yourself and then the audience would like it. So it's always an option to disregard the composer and do what you like anyway. And that is also very fun. You like the piece. And should you fail the composer or yourself? I would prefer that musicians failed rather the composer than themselves. So you have a diminuendo in the music, but you, on the concert feel like a crescendo, go for the crescendo. <laughs> there's, there's a really interesting moment in um, a masterclass with um, Daniel Barenboim, where the pianist plays something that isn't written in the score um, and is sort of maybe sort of slightly counterintuitive to the to, to the, what Baron Bover thought about the music. And so he, he says, why did you play, a, you know, a forte there or something like that? Um, and he, he said, because, because I, I liked it, you know, he didn't have a very good reason to, to, to put that in there. And so Baron Bover was saying, actually, well, no, this, this is part of this phrase. And so this should be like this here. So he, he, he liked to have it in a sort of very rational framework. And just there, I, I noticed to support your, your 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 argument about you know to to um, to play in this way. It, it, here's a, here are the reasons. Here are the historical reasons why you know like Brahms you know played in this way. So if if you don't have good reasons to not follow what the the score says, um, how, how do you how do you make a good case for that? Yeah. Well, this pianist answered very well to Barenboim, and he said well, he did it because he liked it and he had a good reason. Then. Barba made the case, do it this and this way. Then, if this pianist then ends up loving that way more, then he can just continue doing what he likes. 
and then he might do that for one or two concerts. But on the third concert, he misses his forte, and he can do that. But maybe he turns it into a mezzo forte or a fortissimo, and he can do that. So the the freedom is always there. But I think if he end up doing what Barenboim asks him without loving it, I'm sure the audience would react more to an honest forte than a dishonest uh, sort of. Uh, Correct reading. So, but but I mean, Barenboim is a great musician. So, uh, uh, but I wouldn't take away that liberty, and I think many people do not know. So, you see, if you see a poco ritardando in a score by Brahms, you would assume that that means to play a little bit slower, and that you are correct. But they might not know about the letters he wrote to one of his students when performing the third symphony. And then the uh, student asks him, in your symphony, you did a big accelerando to twice the tempo, and then you did a big ritardando to half the tempo, and all of this within one minute, and none of it is in the score, but afterwards you write poco ritardando, and then Brahms answers him, and he says, well, I wrote the poco ritardando into the score because I tend to like it every time. So if you now are a modern student here, at the Royal Northern College of Music and want to play a Brahms Sonata. And you play at the masterclass and then you do a big accelerando and then a big ritardando. It's a big chance that the teacher would say, oh, no, 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 there is no accelerando, no ritardando here. It's only a poco ritardando, you must respect Brahms' intentions. And I would say Brahms' intentions is what he wrote in the letter, not... <laughs> 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 and he was even asked, Brahms was asked, but why do you not write more into the score? And here is a very good quote. He says, he doesn't want to write too much into the score because it would prevent the best musicians of their liberty and the bad musicians will misunderstand it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I think now nowadays, some of the good musicians actually prevent doing what they know, uh, what they really want uh, for the wrong reasons, to be correct. And I think it's, it's actually almost killing off classical music in a way. So I like simple things, uh, simple ways to convey this. So if you really feel like Axel Rando, but you keep the tempo anyway, you're failing what you love about the music. It's not going to help. You might try to keep the tempo straight, you might try Ritterdando, you might try other things, but in the very end, when you are on stage, if you don't listen to your musicality and your impulses there, you are reducing what is possible for you. And if you are at a restaurant and you eat a three course dinner and you like it quite a lot, but the sauce to the fish was a little bit too salt, and then the chef comes to your table and says, what did you think about the food? Yeah, I loved everything, but I think the salt was uh, the sauce was a little bit too salt. And he says, "Well, nothing I can do about it. I just follow the recipe exactly. It's not my fault." Is that an acceptable answer from the chef? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But this is equivalent to, "Well, I just did what my teacher told, or I did what's in the Handel edition." This is the same mm. thing in classical music. We cannot do that. We must own it. We must be on stage. Robert Schumann says it this way. When you go on stage, you should play music you love. You should not go on stage and play music you do not love, but you should always look for more things to love. It's mm -hmm. quite simple. So study the score until you find enough things that you love, that you really have a good story to tell. Then go on stage and re be respectful to the moment. Don't play as you loved it yesterday, but play it as you love it now while you are on stage and then you can later find th things you love even more and you can listen to a recording of it and think okay this actual ando i did doesn't really sound convincing so then you can do maybe less of the actual ando but still get a more sense of urge so i think this uh, english saying less is more you know that yes i think in classical music, I think it, these days, less is less is more. Less is less is the true thing. <laughs> <laughs> to obtain less is more, which can really be powerful, you need to explore the more <laughs> quite mm. a lot. So this is when Anthony Hopkins then speaks very softly. You have the feeling that there is a fortissimo somewhere inside him. 
And that makes this uh, more, more powerful. <laughs> This is this does challenge a lot of things I've learned in the last four years at the RNCM. For example, one of the things that cha what you've said challenges is this notion of good taste. Coming back to the Baron Boy masterclass, I kind of remember the scenario exactly because the student was suddenly playing a forte. Baron Beethoven had not marked anything at all, and Baron Boy asked, "Why are you doing that?" And the student says, "Because I want to convey surprise." And Baron Boy says, "I'm with you, but the surprise had happened earlier because you're only it's only the repetition of the harmony that happened. So the piano that happened before that was the change of harmony, and so it's within good taste." To continue it, because if you're in, if you have informed ears, you see the harmony hasn't changed. So all these feedback made me realize that there is, even though there is a variability, there these variability exist under a banner of good taste or acceptable like uh, acceptable range. Uh, well, of put, put it that way. I think there is uh, what you say. The student said he wanted to surprise. Maybe that is not the highest level. Maybe he should spend more time love finding what he truly loves okay. and then surprise when it happens for the right reason not just to surprise mm -hmm. but but even just the surprise is being present and why not so i think most of the concerts <laughs> are nobody telling any story at all worth listening to so uh good taste what is that i i think uh, <laughs> okay. is such, a, such a thing as good taste you need to overstep that line yourself multiple times to know where it is for you <laughs> and I think right before you overstep the line for good taste is probably where it's very exciting but if you keep very very safe well within what every teacher and everybody tells you you won't even know where that line is and it's just simply boring that's something else <laughs> so the impulse you wanted to surprise was probably because he was bored he didn't want to be boring so he wanted to surprise good. Maybe, maybe even better would be to know the score so well that he had even more things to love. And then maybe he would have uh, surprised on a more suitable chord and maybe even Barabam would have liked it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you do, you do disagree with this presence of a good taste or informed ear? Because well, I go who, is decide, who is to decide what is good taste? It must be the performer himself or herself who should in the end decide. Because if you then would ask say a 19th century painter if he th or she thought picasso was good taste all of them would say picasso is bad taste probably at that time but now they know, now we can appreciate picasso or at least some of his works i don't like everything myself but some of them are really genius so i think uh, the interesting thing would be this person at the master class listening to a recording of their own playing do they enjoy the Subito Forte or not? Or do they actually agree with Baron Boim that a more suitable place would be to to um, add uh, the Subito Forte another place? So I'm not agreeing or disagreeing fully with any of them. The only thing I don't believe is there is such a good thing as uh, so, such a thing as good taste which could be measured. So if oh, yeah. If a conductor or a player say this is good taste, what you do is bad taste, the better thing would be, I don't understand, I don't love what you are doing. Is there other ways you can express it which you will love even more? Or what do you think about this? And then play something to the student and the student would love it even more, but then think I like don't like everything. I want to play it maybe a little bit different there and I love that even more. And in the very end, end up with loving the piece more and not having to blame the score, the composer, or bar remember, or anybody for it. So take the responsibility. This is what um, the author of In a Game of Tennis writes in one of his other books, is that you're always at the driver uh, wheel in a car. So if you, are miss if you are not happy with where the car is driving, and you think, oh, my teacher is not good, the Royal Northern College of Music doesn't have, you know, good enough practicing facilities, and nothing is my, my fault. You're still at the driver's seat of your, the car, which is your life. You're simply not just steering the wheel. You think somebody else steered the wheel, but nobody else is steering the wheel. <laughs> Northern College of Music or your teacher cannot know what you love, can have a hypothesis, but it's only you yourself who know what you truly love.
And you, if you start to define that and move towards it, you are at the driving wheel. And then you, the more responsibility you can take for the direction you drive your life, the better result you will get. So I, I, what I tell my students when they start at the academy is that you are the teacher, you are the institution. So uh, I'm not your teacher. I'm just one person who can possibly help you to become a better teacher for yourself. Because if, if you accept that you are your teacher yourself and your normal teacher is helping you to be a better teacher, then you can have, say, um, 21 lessons a week if you practice three hours a day and you will your progress will skyrocket but if you wait to each lesson once a week with your teacher you have one lesson a week so uh, you might though think that the teacher probably have a good reason for telling you something that means i'm not totally convincing and then try to find the reason behind and then next lesson if your teacher tells you something when you think, oh, I know that, your question to yourself would be, if I know that, why didn't I already do it? <laughs> what was I waiting for? I don't, I don't need my teacher to tell me what I know another time, do I? So quite often, th this means taking the responsibility of the fewer times somebody has to tell you something you actually know yourself, that means you are starting to becoming a teacher. So uh, the the... All the resources, which is at the Royal Northern College of Music, which you can use, you can use to come as far with your personality and dreams as you can, if you think in that way. Mm. But if you are stuck in that, oh, I have to follow the course and do what the teachers tell me, it goes much slower. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it reminds me of this idea that there's always more books in the library than you can read in, in your lifetime. It's all up to you to, to teach yourself and all that sort of stuff. Um, just um, another, another, another point um, uh, I'd like to make is uh, there's a really interesting interview that I, uh, or, um, I watched with um, Christian Zimmerman, um, the, the pianist. And he said that most of his life is spent as a craftsman, sort of. Um, he, the way he puts it, he said, it's almost as though um, you're, you're looking in the mirror and observing what your lips do when they say, I love you. Um, and so it's sort of like this idea of recreating the, the reasons uh, that the, the composer initially had to, uh, for the music. Um, just on, on this point, um, something that you said in the, um, in the concert uh, the other day uh, was that um, you, you want to sort of encourage a new sort of value system, is the way you put it. Um, for, for the future um, of, of, of music. And I, I wonder, just because um, so, so many of the conversations that we've, we've uh, been having here um, uh, is directed towards love. Um, I was wondering whether that is at the centre of this value system that you're trying to encourage. Yes, uh, absolutely. I think uh, I do not believe that you have to struggle through something you dislike to reach a place which you like. I think the fastest to reach a place you like is to build on what you already love or are already passionate about or interested in or feels important. Doesn't it mean to be sort of romantic love or something, but, but like a wide scope, what does really interest you? What fascinates you? And build on to that. And uh, I think this is one of the greatest pleasures I have is then like with working when we were working with the Menuetto movements of the Mozart symphonies here at the Royal Northern College, we had some really great times together and it felt really meaningful. And for me, that, that feeling is worth living for. And I think I would even go so far that I think music life and everything connected with music, that pleasure is not, it shouldn't be limited to those who are musicians. We need to promote, improve, to promote the society again, where all the arts are also possible to express for normal people who want. You don't need to be particularly good in the instrument to get that thrill. So I think one of my encouragements is that I found out that even people who have never played the instrument themselves 
I was in Switzerland doing a concert and there was a man who has never ever played in his life. And I told him how I started. I started to improvise on the black keys of the piano and I found that when I hold the pedal down it become like pentatonic and beautiful sounds. I didn't know it was called pentatonic. Uh, but then I told this and uh, he come up on stage and I said, just press down this pedal and play like this and we play together and we started to play and it become really great and he performed in front of a full audience without ever having played the uh, uh, instrument in his whole life and he liked it so i do think if we are going to make a green shift we must have and here i think the green shift will not be successful without arts or the arts uh, contributing to make quality of life for people better and not measured in money, but measured in in sort of uh, meaningfulness, love, uh, something, creativity. And then I can see a future where do people have something meaningful to do, like on their free time, for instance, or any, anything. These days, of course, we have plenty of things you can consume, which are great. I do it myself. I watch Netflix and I read books and uh, listen to audiobooks. Fantastic. But I think the joy of creativity itself to make something, it seems like most people are born with it. If you go to kindergarten or something, most three and four or five year old, they enjoy to make drawings, they express themselves, build something out of clay or in of sand or something like that. So I think this joy is in every person. If we manage to create a society where we as musicians don't think of, of, of professional musicians who are going to perform something to an audience only, but that we are facilitating a more creative society where we can be missionaries. We will try to share the joy of creating with everyone. And then I think with all the arts, painting, dance, uh, music it's not about the level you are but about the passion so uh, if you stop measuring in like how clean is it how together is it i've had some of my most fantastic movement, uh, moments in my life working with amateur orchestras mm. if you just pick the right repertoire and you have a bunch of people playing from their heart it can be wonderful it doesn't need to be professional musicians and this seems that the audience like it also so if you can spread this type of mentality enough and take a responsibility for the whole society then i think i don't need to go to the far east for a holiday or anything like that a holiday for me would be to to share good music with my uh, family or friends or do things i do something go, go on holiday but i think uh, i don't want a sailboat i don't want to buy a cottage <laughs> i don't don't really need it uh, and i think that what brings me most joy i think we can spread around to many more and at least own the creativity within classical music. So I think we have something to learn by pop and jazz musicians who form a band and start to make their own music straight away. I think we have become too much uh, the humble servant of the great composers. We should, all of us, be creative. We should Im improvise, compose, do something uh, uh, like that, or at least attempt. And my experience now with most of my uh, students is that most are way better than they think. Almost all of them say, oh, I'm not good at improvisation. Almost all of them, after just attempting two or three times, find out, oh, this is so fun. So most of my students now ask, can we start with a little bit of improvisation? And it is so wonderful to see how little it takes to, to, to get this. But, uh, uh, so the challenge I said, said in the concert, in case there are other people listening, even if you don't know music at all, you cannot read music. If you have a cell phone, try to sing a little bit where you invent the notes, try to play on the instrument, even if you don't know how to play on it. The piano is in your living room or at your workplace. Try to play a few notes, record yourself and do that for every day for a couple of weeks. And then if you know how to write down music you can write down say the best of those which you like most and you're a composer if you don't know how to 
uh, write music. I got an email from a person in Switzerland who didn't know how to write music, who sent me a piece. So the challenge, which I mean then, next time I'm at the Royal Northern College of Music, if, if any of the listeners here <laughs> send uh, me a little melody, we will write it down, arrange it, and play it in the concert. It's very, very easy to become a composer. You can be it in no time whatsoever. So we need to, uh, we call it a doorstep mile in our way. It means that to just go the threshold to go out of your door, that's the hardest part. The two miles which follows afterward is very easy. You just need to start. So if you want to be creative, again, not only sit and consume TikTok or uh, YouTube or Netflix, but also make something of yourself, make something creativity blank piece of uh, paper start to make drawings again can be anything but i think that joy is what could make a true green shift uh, possible because then we don't need to destroy earth to get more and more and think that money and value is the true joy of life it's not mm, yeah pretty point did you have a question? yeah i just wanted to ask during during rehearsals you, you mentioned that you uh you tell your orchestra to to have fun even when you're not there uh, could you talk more about this and how are the ways that we can have fun in, in group as like playing uh yeah very curious about this yes well i made sort of an agreement with my orchestra and told them many times that uh each and one of them, this is Arctic Philharmonic Chamber Orchestra in Tromsø, and each one of them are responsible for their own happiness. That means that if they don't like what I'm saying, or I've invited someone who has a little bit boring rehearsal and they are a little bit bored, that's their own fault that they are bored. They can do something about it. They can start to look for an angle within whatever they are doing, which they enjoy more physically or phrasing or, and start with their responsibility. So meaningfulness is always possible for each individual player, even in a big symphonic orchestra, even with a repertoire you don't love and a conductor you don't like. Even then you can, if you have a bad time, change your focus and then start to look for things which feels valuable and express. Once you start to do that, and this is again uh, inspired by the, the author of Inner Game of Tennis, mm -hmm. he managed to work with people who answer the telephones, uh, like uh, inquiries, like 30 second long telephones. People say, uh, can you put me through to the social uh, security department or something like that? And they felt they had a meaningful, meaningless job. But even, even in a job like that, you can find meaning and change your perspective. So I think as an orchestra musician, for instance, how extremely much more possibilities we have. And then on, once you take the responsibility for that yourself, then of course, look for the best people you can play chamber music with who share your points of view. But even if you then end up in a concert and you play with three, four people, and some of them are not that inspiring or something, see what your own contribution can do. And you, you will quite soon find out that it can be very contagious. Mm -hmm. that, and if you get into discussions about meaningless things, uh, or people start quarreling about what is right and wrong, uh, another good book, uh, which is called Effect by some authors, uh, I can send this to you so you can post later on the website. Uh, but this is also, people can be very provoked if you tell them what you don't like. So if you tell someone, don't rush or do, I mean, do not choose this angle. Pro try to promote what you yourself love. So if you say, oh, I love this phrase, if it's da 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 da, people are not provoked by, by what you love, but they might be inspired by it. So that if you dare to show what you really like, and if they should then treat you and say, oh, I don't like you to take so much freedom, then ask, how do you like it? And then find out, and if this, oh, I like it this and this way, and then you can try it that way. But if you then play with somebody who refuse to do that, oh no, let's just do what's in the score. I, 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 
and they they are not sort of advocating uh, what they're loving but uh, then you, you can still influence but then then don't have any bad conscience if you ask for more things that you love because you have given that that person a chance to express what they they love but if they don't it is good if, if you are like eight people playing an octet for instance you cannot uh, assume that every eight would have equally much passion and tell equally much what they love but still i do, don't want those who really love it to speak too little just to not offend those others who do do, do not express what they love <laughs> because you will end up not with the best possible so it's better ask people what what do you like try to get a discussion try out different ways of doing it but don't let the second viola player who looks very mad and don't open his mouth and uh, don't want to do anything don't let that discourage you but try to continue to fight for what you love in a positive way and most of the times it works well so people tend to get most cross if you say I don't like this do not do that or like if you attack them but if you tell what you love and you have an open air for what the other persons also love then you can have a win-win situation where you end up with something better than any of you have thought and those have been the most lucky times when i've played in piano trio piano quintet or piano quartet or something and everybody has different views but everybody dare to share it and you end up with it with a result which is better than any of us had thought in beforehand because we are then using the best sides of all of the persons so uh, this is of course the ideal world but but always look for it and there is always possibility to have a meaningful time so even if you are then in a group where people really don't like to do any rubato and play it really strict, well, there are, is pro probably a scope of freedom you can do even within that and, you know, <laughs> have some uh, fun. So th there isn't one way. It's not like if you don't get your will 100%, you have to be miserable. No, you can still have a good time. And even then, even if you play music you don't understand at all let's say my orchestra play uh, um, a work for the first time by an intellectual composer and there isn't much to understand you can still have a good time physically and once you start to feel good physically suddenly oh maybe i can do it and then your musicality is uh, started uh, from a different angle and then maybe you end up liking that piece much better <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so there i think it's meaningfulness is always possible in my i tell in this uh, article uh will you post this how meaningful do you want your life to be post it well, how so no no so any listeners can read it also oh, okay. yeah. yeah yeah of course yeah yeah, yeah. I, can, I, I can send you the, the newest version to you afterwards yeah yeah that'd be great. and anyway in the, i talked there about for me there is really three devils one devil is perfectionism that's when i want the surface to be good i want everything to be perfect that mm. ruined my life for years and years that i've replaced with meaningfulness so perfectionism to play perfect is never possible to play meaningful is always possible they are very related but i would choose the cousin meaningfulness rather than perfectionism try to not mm have your uh, aim to play perfect it will uh, ruin your life i think but <laughs> meaningfulness even after doing a big mistake you can find meaning meaning is always possible to find the other devil in my paradise would be over control that means you try to control every aspect like everything so i replaced that by doing looking for things i love one and one things and then respecting the moment so i will do what feels right at the moment but this uh, this is of course a degree so i still challenge with over control but at least i know what to do to not succumb to it totally the third is stress so stress for me means that i either think about something i fear in the future or something i uh, thought was terrible in the past mm -hmm and uh, that is uh, i replace with a sort of mindfulness 
I think the easiest way is then to improvise, you know, to be present, but also to value that when I get stressed, I will try to find something in the moment which I like. It's awareness for something which happens now and then. And almost every concert you will have all of these three devils present at some times. So it's more important to do what you do during your practice to not fall deeper and deeper, deeper into that pit. So how do you practice not to be a perfectionist? Well, I remind myself when I do a mistake that I do not love the piece I'm playing any less because I, I did that mistake. And then that makes me connect with what I love more easily. So if I'm alone in my room and they decide, no, I want to play through this movement by Bach, and already after four bars, I do a big mistake, part of me wants, oh, no, I destroyed everything. I must start from the beginning again. If I do that, I succumb to the devil of perfectionism. So I do not let myself do that. I continue and I play through the whole movement. And the quicker I get back to what I love and I appreciate, the less power that mistake or the devil of perfectionists have over me. So what I do in my daily practice helps me in the concert. So do not look for mistakes. Do not stop at the first time you play a note out of tune. Decide in advance, I will play two phrases. Then I can practice some intonation. Then I play the two phrases again. Because if you always stop, you get good at doubting yourself. You get good at looking for faults. You always get better at what you practice, but you always practice along with what you think you're practicing quite a lot of other things. So mainly find things to love. Then when you're playing, playing it, do not look for faults, but look for achievement of what you love. And when you don't achieve it, see how quickly you can get back of being present. That would be my advice. Uh, and uh, th th that can be like a practicing technique. So uh, the, the how I practice, I define, no, I want to play through that movement, then I do it. I don't allow myself to stop at the first mistake because that's not what I can do in concerts anyway. And it just uh, gets me, uh, you know, not in a good place. So things like that really helps and makes a difference. Mm, really lovely. Um, I think we're, we're sort of coming to the, the end of the time we've booked for the, mm. the for the room. Yes, but, absolutely. Um, yeah, um, just just to sort of. I'll definitely link that post to any. Yeah, I have sent. I have sent you my articles. I also have a couple of articles about the improvisation. I will send. Mm, just to sort of wrap things up, then um, one of our other speakers that we've had here, um, John Viveki, um, he, he he claims that all of our society is in the midst of this sort of crisis of meaning um, and uh, this is met with like a mental health crisis uh, he's a he's a cognitive scientist and psychologist so he, he uh, was very you know carefully tracked all of these things that are happening across the world and um, so we're, he, he says says that you know this this crisis of meaning can be um, alleviated and, and, and helped to be solved by um, by what he calls ecologies of practices and, and so mindfulness practice is, is one of those um, ways of alleviating this meaning. But I think as you've um, really lovely um, demonstrated here uh, is for um, doing what you love is also another way to solve that crisis. Yes, and I think also then to spread the joy of creativity, not only to, through the, to the artists, but also to the general population. I think if people make something, uh, and it can be knitting a sweater or it can make a beautiful garden. It can be anything, but to make something, but also we need more amateur musicians, more amateur composers, uh, more amateur painters. I think that uh, to value creativity more, hopefully then change our education system away from robbing people from the, their creativity, more to stimulating all the way from kindergarten tr through all the stages of normal school also so it's less about just learning facts and more about seeing, seeing how everything can be a part of uh, a, a creative process so i do really much believe in that even in mathematics or uh, 
learning grammar. I think you can use creativity to make that a fantastic process. Mm. And then we don't only use the analytic part of the brain, but the full uh, humanity. Mm, beautiful. Well, I think that's a lovely place to end. Thank you so much for that one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. um, uh, if, if you're okay with that, I'll... Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. See you then. Yeah, see ya. See ya. See ya, see ya.